It's Monday, November 8th, and this is now on HNN. The State Education Department launches its first vaccine clinic for elementary school students. The U.S. is once again welcoming international travelers. I'm Elise Preston with what that means for the American tourism industry. A growing memorial for the victims who died during a crowd surge at a music festival in Houston, Texas. The latest on the investigation. Plus, a massive volcano on the Spanish island of La Palma is not the only thing roaring. These stories and more coming up on This Is Now. Aloha, everyone. Hope you're having a good Monday. You're watching This Is Now. Casey London, Ashley Nagaoka coming to you from the H&N Digital Center. Ash, let's get to the latest numbers from the State Department of Health. The state is reporting 94 new infections today. The breakdown by island shows 39 cases on Oahu, 33 on Kauai, 17 on the Big Island, and 8 on Maui. Today, the Education Department kicked off its first school-based vaccination clinic for younger keiki, administering COVID shots to dozens of kids at Kalihi Uka Elementary School. Sammy Solina takes us there. Kalihi Uka is the first public school that will be holding a vaccination clinic for those 5 to 11 years old, and staff hopes this will make the school a safer place to learn. Um, this has always been a, an issue with children that are too young to take the vaccine. You know, coming to school um, without being vaccinated, it's, it's made it a little more stressful for teachers, but it's just going to, I think, feel safer, and I think it's going to be safer. About a quarter of eligible students signed up today for the clinic. At Kalihi Uka, parents won't be able to come on campus for their children's shot because of the small space and the amount of time it would take to check everyone's vaccination status. There are several parents who asked if they were allowed on campus, and we did have to let them know that we couldn't. So parents, some parents have decided that they'll be taking their children to another vaccination clinic. About 160 schools have expressed interest in having their own clinics. Parents will have to check in with their individual campuses to see if an event could be in their future. What we hope to do is get the, to the majority of those in the next three weeks because we'd really like to get the kids fully vaccinated before Christmas holiday comes around in the new year. Parents admit that this can be a difficult decision for them, but for those who choose to get the shot, they'll have a convenient option. I do have older parents that, you know, are vulnerable, like we all are, um, but just in, a little extra vulnerable. Um, so for me, getting vaccinated and having my children vaccinated gave us that extra protection. Because if I get sick, I can, it, the shot can keep me from getting more, even more sick from the coronavirus. The Department of Health says there's more than 118,000 children between the ages of 5 to 11. Sammy Solina for This Is Now. The Healthcare Association of Hawaii is hoping that at least half of the 118,000 kindergarten through sixth grade age group gets vaccinated. Vaccinations for public school students is not required unless you're a student athlete. Hundreds of elementary school-age kids across the state have already gotten their first shots. Hawaii Pacific Health says more than 1,500 appointments were scheduled in just the first five hours when its appointment system went online last week. Ken Long's pharmacies across the state are now offering the Pfizer kids vaccine. For any keiki getting vaccinated, a parent or legal guardian must provide consent. You can make an appointment online at cvs.com. Today, the U.S. is once again welcoming travelers from 33 different countries who are banned for nearly 20 months because of COVID rules. Elise Preston has more on how the big change is boosting the nation's tourism industry. The return of international travelers is not only reuniting loved ones. How are you feeling right now? I don't have words. It's also reconnecting millions of tourists to U.S. industries that depend on their dollars, including airlines. Delta has seen a 450% increase in international bookings, and hotels like the Fitzpatrick Grand Central in Manhattan are once again welcoming foreign visitors. How are you feeling? Uh, we're excited. We really are. Owner John Fitzpatrick saw business drop 90% at one point but now is expecting a surge of holiday guests. Our business for the first two weeks of December is greater than it was in the same month in 2019. 
The U.S. Travel Association says the decline of international visitors during the pandemic has led to a loss of $300 billion and 1 million American jobs. But now hiring is ramping up, including in U.S. towns along the Mexican border, like Southern California's San Ysidro, where 80 percent of tourists are from Mexico. Big cities are also getting a boost. About half of all tourism spending in New York comes from international travelers, according to NYC and Company. It's a similar story in San Francisco. In 2019, just to give you an example, 63 percent of all tourism spending in San Francisco is by international visitors. And that has been shut down since the beginning of the pandemic. Foreign travelers tend to stay longer and spend more money. Two big reasons why the tourism industry is welcoming them back. Elise Preston, CBS News, New York. President Biden's vaccine mandate for large companies is already facing legal challenges. On Saturday, a federal appeals court blocked the mandate. The rule does not have an immediate impact because the mandate is scheduled to start on January 4th for companies with at least 100 workers. But it signals that the White House faces a tough road ahead. Opponents argue that the mandate is unconstitutional. The Biden administration says it's confident in its legal authority. President Biden is back in Washington, D.C. today with a long-awaited victory under his belt. Congress passed the $1 trillion infrastructure bill, but his social spending bill still faces an uphill battle. Natalie Brand has more from the nation's capital. Mr. President, do you feel some momentum now? President Biden is back at the White House Monday with a boost from Friday's 11th hour passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. The motion is adopted. The bill provides $110 billion to repair aging highways, roads and bridges. $105 billion to modernize rail and public transit, $65 billion each to strengthen the electrical grid and expand broadband access, and $55 billion to upgrade water pipes. What all of these investments have in common is that they will create jobs. States like Connecticut are already lining up projects and getting the word out. There's a whole lot of other people who don't even understand the opportunities that will now be available to them to enter an apprenticeship program, that jobs are coming to Connecticut, that this is what this will mean long term. The greater challenge is the president's bigger legislative goal, a nearly $2 trillion social spending plan known as the Build Back Better bill. The current version includes money for climate change, universal pre-K and prescription drug reform. House Democratic leaders are hoping for a vote next week if they can get the cost estimate requested by moderates. The bill faces an even tougher climb in the 50-50 Senate. We're going to do everything we can to stop it dead in its tracks. With no GOP support, that means all 50 Democratic senators would have to get on board. I think this will be the biggest pro-child bill that will have been done in the history of this country, even if some pieces of it are still being negotiated. Democrats want to try to pass the bill by Thanksgiving. Natalie Brandt, CBS News, the White House. The head of FedEx says the company should be able to meet holiday deliveries on time if they can hire enough employees. CEO Fred Smith says FedEx has processed 90,000 applications since November 1st. It's unclear how many of them have been hired so far. FedEx predicts that it will deliver 100 million more shipments this holiday season than they did in 2019. Investigators are still working to determine how eight people died in a crowd surge at a music festival in Houston, Texas. Authorities will be using videos, witness interviews, and a review of concert procedures to figure out what went wrong during a performance by rapper Travis Scott. Jay Gray has the latest. Survivors will tell you these horrific images don't fully capture the fear and panic that night. I couldn't breathe like I really couldn't breathe gasping for air like drowning in people. A sea of fans 50,000 or more surging toward the stage eight people caught in that wave killed. <laughs> There were cries for help in the chaos. This woman climbing a camera riser. Travis Scott did pause multiple times during his performance, but the show would go on. Today, the family of 21-year-old Axel Costa, who died at the concert, joined others who have filed civil suits against the rapper claiming negligence and encouragement of violence. In 2015, Scott pleaded guilty to reckless conduct after urging fans to rush past security at the Lollapalooza Music Festival in Chicago. Two years later, he was arrested in Arkansas after again telling fans to bypass security and crash the stage. Several people were injured 
including a police officer. You go to a concert to have fun. You don't go to a concert to die. His family says Donish Bay died protecting his fiance. And he saved her, and it cost him his life. <laughs> the emotions and pain still raw days after the tragedy. There are reports this evening that Scott will be paying for the funerals of all eight fans who died during his show. Jay Gray, NBC News, Houston. The man who allegedly set the Waikiki surfboard rack on fire is set to enter a plea in court today. Police say Glenn Helton was caught on the city's surveillance cameras last month, testing a lighter he found on the ground behind the police substation. The fire caused more than $650,000 in damage and destroyed 500 boards. It's been two years since a surfer on Maui went missing, and as our Jolani Martinez explains, his loved ones, his mother, is not ready to give up hope just yet. The mother of 23-year-old Aiden Dungan says they haven't got any updates since her son disappeared. Now that there is a new Maui police chief, she's optimistic that authorities can revisit her son's case. Aiden went missing November 7, 2019. Parents say they were told Aiden walked away from his halfway house in Wailuku that night. The mother says they've spoken to detectives a few times, but nothing's really happening. She adds that it took several months for an official missing report to be issued. That crucial time when they could have investigated, when they could have had people out questioning people, that was lost. So nothing's moved forward, really. You know, it's an open wound. We, we think about them all, all the time, every day. Not a, a day goes by when my husband or, and I don't think of them. We're always looking and we're always hoping, of course, but uh, it's difficult. Yeah, there's no closure. The mom says Aiden supposedly sold his moped and someone may have taken his money, but she adds that it's never really been fully investigated. Aiden suffers from a severe mental illness. His parents say he always kept in touch with them, either talked or texted daily. Maui police says the case is still under investigation, but there are no updates at this time. If anyone has seen Aiden, contact the Maui Police Department at 244-6400. Jolani Martinez, Kauai News Now. On Kauai, staffing is tight for the Kauai Fire Department. The fire chief tells the Garden Island newspaper there are 15 vacancies in the department. 14 people retired over the last year and one longtime firefighter passed away. The fire chief says the department is maintaining minimum staffing at each of the island stations, but that requires firefighters to work overtime and to come in during their time off. A new recruit class started at the beginning of the month. That will add eight new firefighters when their training is completed in six months. The race for Hawaii's next lieutenant governor is still a year away, but it's attracting a crowded field with six candidates already in the running. Rick Desog has the story. The candidates include longtime State House member and Finance Committee Chair Sylvia Luke and her former counterpart in the state Senate, Jill Tokuda. Two former city council members, Ikaika Anderson and Ron Menor, who is also a longtime former state lawmaker. Two business leaders, Sherry Menor McNamara of the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii and Keith Amamiya, who also ran unsuccessfully for mayor last year, are also running for LG. Really, it's it's probably anyone's race, but I think that, you know, um, uh, Takuda Anderson and um, Amamiya are likely to have the most name recognition. UH political scientist Colin Moore says money will be a key in a crowded race like this. Money in general can be decisive because, you know, as well known as a lot of these folks are to people who follow politics, they're not that well known um, among average voters. And so you need that money to build your name recognition. Amamiya raised nearly $2.4 million in 2020's Honolulu mayoral race, in which he received nearly 150,000 votes. Tokuda raised nearly 800 grand in her campaign for lieutenant governor in 2018. Moore says union endorsements will also play a critical role. For sure, Ikaika Anderson would benefit from union endorsements. He has cl close relationship with the unions already. Jill Takuda, for sure. Um, Sylvia Luke. I mean, really any of them will, will benefit from this. In the past mayor's race, Amamiya also received endorsements from the Hawaii Government Employees Association and the United Public Workers Union. So getting their endorsements again could provide a huge boost. These crowded races can be really unpredictable. It really means you've got to turn out your people. Um, you know, that ends up being really important. 
Rick Desog, Hawaii News Now. Thank you, Rick, and sort of a cloudy day out there, Ash. Mm-hmm. We'll check in with Guy Hoggy. He's got the first look at our weather. How's it on this Monday? We've got really nice conditions out there, but there will be a few passing showers for a handful of windward spots, mainly this morning. Uh, leeward side should remain fairly dry. And those trade winds will be running a little on the slower side today, 10 to 15 from Kauai to Maui, lighter, of course, for the Kona side of the Big Island. So we're in for a standard trade wind weather day. That does include a few passing showers today, mainly for windward neighborhoods, lots of leeward sunshine. Uh, there are no weather alerts out there, and the UV index will still be high at 7. Surf's not high at all. A small boost is due into the south shores tomorrow. A bigger swell is due into north and west shores by Friday into Saturday, so watch for that. So we've got light trade winds today becoming light and variable from tomorrow all the way into the weekend. And that means afternoon clouds and afternoon showers are likely starting from Tuesday into the weekend. And some of those showers might even be briefly heavy, but they won't be widespread. Well, although we could see more widespread rain sometime on Sunday. Uh, keep it here on Hawaii News Now. We'll have all your severe weather updates. <laughs> And take a look at this. While UH might not have been able to pull it off against the Aztecs over the weekend on Saturday, it was enough to get Billy V pumped up. Billy, <laughs> <laughs> I love that video. We played it uh, over the weekend, and I wanted to bring it up again. But, you know, uh, granted, you know, they didn't win, but uh, this was a huge step forward in the right direction. Prior to this, there was still um, pretty strict crowd limits, right? Oh, yeah. It was 500 for two games, a, a couple of games, but then we finally got to be open wide. We had student section that hasn't been that strong, pumped up, energized screaming yelling like a big college game since probably since the Colt Brennan days yeah you've got to think a lot of those kids that have been going to school here since the pandemic almost two football seasons now haven't got to do that thing that we all you know those of us that went to uh, a college with a football program got to go tailgate go to the game what was it what was it like for them do you think uh it, it was incredible i mean they were yelling screaming they were singing together during in between quarters they had all their phones with the lights on going back and forth um but, you know, when you talk about college football and being able to cheer your team on, they were there, they represented, they gave the energy, and the players just fed off of that. Oh, I imagine. Oh, what's still left to come? Because as I understand it, and this is all city and county, it's not UH. UH is just abiding by the current regulations, of course. But right. you still can't have concessions, right? No concessions. There's no food there. There is yeah. water water that's all that they sell there so that's it and there is only one more game it's senior night coming in two weeks so um one more chance for football to enjoy a full house of people cheering on rainbow warrior football and obviously a lot of fun for you too and everybody on the sidelines yes but now things kind of change because wednesday night starts the outrigger classic for men's basketball women's volleyball returns to the stan sheriff center this weekend I'm going to be living at the Stanshire Center for a little bit. I bet you are. You, uh, you, uh, you're one of those guys that's always working, but uh, when you enjoy what you do, right, you know what they say. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Casey. Thank you so much. All right. I, have a, I know a bunch of people who went uh, over the weekend to that game case, and they said it's a really cool venue. Look packed. Yeah. Well, let's see what the Internet's talking about. So ketchup, <laughs> one of my favorite condiments, and Heinz is unveiling its first Mars edition ketchup. That's right. So the ketchup was made with tomatoes grown on Earth but in Mars-like conditions. So astrobiologists at the Aldrin Space Institute in Florida, they grew the tomatoes in con a, a controlled environment with soil temperature and water conditions similar to the red planets. Now, the experiment shows the possibility of long-term food production on Mars. Unfortunately, though, it's not available for purchase, but the research team and former NASA astronaut Mike Massimino will be the first to taste it on Wednesday. Very cool. Well, an effort to encourage childhood vaccinations is drawing a little heat from a U.S. senator. Check it out. Of course, that's Big Bird, who's perpetually six years old on Sesame <laughs> Street. He tweeted and got in a little trouble. Um, he tweeted that he got his COVID shot, adding, quote, my wing is feeling a little sore, but it'll give my body an extra protective boost that keeps me and others healthy. President Biden retweeted the post, writing, good on you, Big Bird. Although Texas Senator Ted Cruz 
didn't feel the same way. Mm-hmm. He had a different response, writing, quote, government propaganda for your five-year-old. Oh, Ted. Okay, for controversy. <laughs> well, you guys, Thanksgiving coming up. Uh, yeah. And if you're all about, you know, a liquid diet, Jones, <laughs> the soda company, has you covered. So known for their unusual flavors like bacon, Christmas ham, even dirt. Jones is bringing back its turkey and gravy soda. Now, the flavor combo hasn't been around for about a decade, but it's back on store shelves in celebration of Jones's 25th anniversary. Oh, I don't know about Young, that. Ash. Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> We're not even that close to Thanksgiving yet. I can't imagine what other kind of weird, crazy yeah. flavors are going to come up. Uh-huh. We'll see. Well, that massive volcano on the Spanish island of La Palma is still very active at this Mm -hmm. time. Some beautiful images, Mm -hmm. and it's drawing a lot of tourists. But that's not all. A lot of people are also coming for a completely separate event. Ian Lee has more. Snaking around the streets of La Palma, you can't miss the massive volcano. For weeks, it's dominated the small island, but recently, among its roar, is another rumble. A classic car tour, but it's not the Mustang or Corvette that's turning heads. To see this volcano uh, erupting is uh, a lifetime experience. I've never been so close to a volcano. The vintage vehicles rolled in for a 19-day tour covering all the Spanish Canary Islands, but La Palma is the showstopper. It's fantastic, the power of nature. Many left their most prized possessions at home, bringing newer cars because it is a natural disaster. (laughs) Plus ash ain't good for the paint. Almost ready to go. Just get the roof down so we can get all the volcanic ash in our faces, that's the plan. As for the volcano's plan, scientists say they just don't know when it'll decide to hit the brakes. Ian Lee, CBS News. Oh, I gotta get over there, Ash. I want to see that Long volcano. Ways away. You're very right. <laughs> <laughs> well, time for some good news, you guys. So age is nothing but a number to Julia Hurricane Hawkins. Check her out. At 105 years old, she set a new world and U.S. record in the 100-meter race at the Louisiana Senior Games over the weekend. Now, she is the first woman and first American to set a Masters track and field world record in the 105-plus age division. (laughs) Her time for the 100-meter race was just short of one minute and three seconds. Now, to give you some perspective, the world record for all runners of all ages is 9.58 seconds. So Hawkins says she's going to keep running as long as she can. She says she finds it fun and that she really enjoys doing it. She's probably in better shape than I am, and that's sad. <laughs> that's going to be uh, our own Ashley Nagaoka, oh, though. Yeah, and sure. speaking of this, I wanted to just bring this up uh, one last time. We ran it on the weekend, too. But you guys, uh, you and Steph were yeah. at uh, the half marathon, right? Yes, it was our first official half marathon uh, in person. This was the uh, yeah. Valna Lasco half. Uh, Kapilani to Aina Haina and back. It was really cool oh, to be out cool. there again with, you know, runners and me and Steph and Ben uh, are actually training training for the uh, Honolulu Marathon next month. And that is going to be all vaccinated all folks vaccinated. as well. But mm-hmm. the good news for a lot of people is yeah. that it's still happening, right? Yep, that's right. All righty. <laughs> well, thank you so much for watching. This is now on this Aloha Monday, everyone. We're going to have all your updates and headlines coming up on First at Four. Uh, me and Mark will be with you at First at Four. And of course, you can stay up to date with any of the news happening throughout the day on HNN's digital platforms. We'll see ya.